This is Jeremy Bassetti, and you're listening to Travel Writing World, a podcast featuring interviews with travel writers about their work and about the business and craft of travel writing. You can find the episode show notes, free travel writing resources, and much more at travelwritingworld.com. For the past 40 years, Steve McCurry has been traveling the world and photographing its beauty. He is known for creating some of the most iconic images of our time, like the photograph of Sharbat Gula, the Afghan girl who appeared on the cover of National Geographic in 1985. Now, Steve McCurry has published a new collection of photographs called In Search of Elsewhere, which contains some new and previously unpublished photographs from his archives. We also talk about life in lockdown and what he thinks about photographic criticism like the colonial gaze. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So you are perhaps best known for your photograph of Sharbat Gula, commonly known as the Afghan girl, whose uh, green eyes first appeared on the cover of a National Geographic uh, magazine back in 85, I think. But now you have a new collection of photographs called In Search of Elsewhere, which is a beautiful, enormous object, enormous book. Uh, I think that gets published later this month, and it's November 2020. Can you tell us a little bit about this new collection of photographs? Sure. We have this very intensive scanning project going, looking at all of my work over the last sort of 40 years. You know, so often when you're dashing from one place to the next, you come back from a trip and you do a quick selection of your work, and then perhaps you're off somewhere else, and that you, you've only had one pass at the selection process. And so sometimes, you know, months or years goes by, and you, you haven't revisited that work again. And that's, so that's what I did. I went back and looked at some of my assignments and projects from the, the 80s and the 90s, and sort of finding pictures which had originally been overlooked, pictures which maybe in the passage of time have taken on more more significance. Uh, you know, the world's changed. It's changing, you know, so rapidly all the time. And I think that you, when you go back and look at pictures that are, you know, 20, 30, 40 years old, they take on that kind of patina of age. And uh, it's sometimes you're really pleasantly surprised of what, what you've seen. And then I don't know, styles change and your mood changes. And perhaps on the first selection process, you were looking for only one specific sort of thing. So this was a chance to kind of go back and look at some of my early work. There's also some recent work from even the end of last year, pictures which had not been published. So it's a little bit of the old and some of the new pictures of Cuba from last year, uh, Antarctica, a place I'd never been to before. So I'm really, I think it's a great kind of look back, but also uh, looking at kind of what I've done recently. It's interesting. I was going to ask you if some of these images were from the old slide film days and, and digital images, but it seems that there there are uh, images from both both days. Yes, that's so, right. Yeah. Very good. So this, the subtitle of the book is Unseen Images, and you've just mentioned that you have some newer images here, uh, the ones from the um, Arctic and uh, from Cuba. And some of the images I, I recognize from other, other publications, uh, I think from the publication that you did with Paul Theroux many years ago called The Imperial Way that deals with trains and um, Pakistan yeah. and India. Um, I can recognize some of those. About how many images here are new and there are some how many are... Yeah, I think that the majority are pictures which have not been published. Maybe they've been on Instagram, or there are a few pictures which I had published in, uh, you know, a book such as uh, The Imperial Way with Paul Theroux from back in, you know, 86 or whenever it was, which maybe had been uh, ran small or maybe the color wasn't so good, but I thought it'd be better to kind of revive the picture. <clears throat> take another look at it. But by and large, uh, there are pictures which were not published at the time of the, the, of the, the particular trip that I was on. Hmm. So as you alluded to, you, you probably have hundreds of thousands of, of negatives and film positives and uh, digital images. Like how, do you, how, how did you 
as someone with this amount of work uh, approach or think about a project like this? I mean, like, did you have a theme in mind, an idea of a book, and you just like powered up the slide projector <laughs> and say, oh, this one's nice. Like, how did that, how does it work? Well, I went through, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, thousands of pictures. I was looking for common threads. I was looking for pictures which would, once I made the selection of all the pictures to scan, I wanted to see what, which pictures would juxtapose and what kind of stories were these pictures telling and how would they compare to maybe recent pictures or whatever. So I was just uh, trying to look at different ideas and put together uh, almost like, like I said, like a poem of the kind of flows between maybe regions or countries or ideas or maybe the color palette is something which pictures put together and make an interesting comment. So, so you think about things like juxtaposition, you think about things like ph- photographic narrative, storytelling, in the way in which you arrange these images in your book? Yeah, I think, I think that for me, the, in photography, in my work wandering around, I think I'm always looking for a particular a story. I'm looking for some emotional content. I'm looking for something that makes a comment about a person or this, you know, our, our, our you know, life at this point in time. I have one picture of a woman walking down the street in Cuba, walking next to this wedding shop. And I thought it was so kind of poignant, the, the sort of hopes and dreams in the window and forward thinking and optimism and youth. And, and then sometimes the reality of life People walking out on the street in front of the shop, it, it makes a certain kind of comment about, you know, life is often disappointing and it's full of struggles and mm. and uh, all that. Yeah, what what I like about the book, I have a copy in front of me, and it's a beautiful, massive object, is, is that, you know, the pictures speak for themselves. You, know, you don't have captions next to the images. You have them, of course, in the back of the book, but... Uh, not next to the images themselves. So, you know, the viewer is left to kind of imagine or reconstruct or kind of make sense of the image him or herself without any sort of uh, prodding. You know, it's it's just yeah. it's there. Um, and some of those images, as you mentioned, are very, very interesting. One that struck struck me is an image, I don't remember where it was, but there are two women and they're completely veiled and they're looking in a shop window, I think a jewelry store. Yes, yeah, it's in uh, Mumbai in, in, in India. Uh-huh. Yes, yeah, beautiful, beautiful image. Uh, and the shopkeeper is kind of peering out the shop. And Oh, oh, that's the picture in uh, in Afghanistan. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that is a jewelry store. They're, they're uh, <clears throat> on the street looking at jewelry probably for a wedding that they were going to attend. Yeah, be just beautiful images that, you know, feed the imagination and, you know, the viewer of these images try to piece together the story, like what what is going on. Not that we are expecting any kind of epic story or anything, but it's just interesting to think about, right? The, the power of the imagination and the stories here through the images themselves. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So my, my podcast focuses on travel writing, right? The written word. Uh, uh-huh. But as you're kind of mentioning here, and we can tell stories about our travels um, visually, right? We can tell the story about the yes. world, stories about the world visually. Um, you know, photographer photography literally means like drawing or writing with light. So uh, the the creative process, I think, is fundamentally similar. But yet, you've been working with and are friends with people. Um, who I've, I've spoken with on this podcast, people like Paul Theroux and Pico Iyer, who wrote this nice forward to this new book. So how do you see yourself and, and, and your work uh, in light of like the travel question? Do you see yourself as a photojournalist, a storyteller, a photographer, a documenter? Yeah, I see maybe more of a kind of more of a kind of a poet maybe at this point, kind of photographing the world. I mean, I don't know what the label, um, <laughs> what kind of label to put myself because it kind of pigeonholes you. But yeah. I, I guess it's a documentary, photographing my life, uh, things that interest me and not so much, um, you know, maybe when you're working for a magazine or a newspaper, you have certain expectations or they they want a, a list to, to shoot from or they want a certain point of view. And you, you kind of have all that off in the back of your mind that you 
you know, there's a deadline and they expect certain kind of pictures. So you often spend so much of the time kind of racing around trying to do that shopping list. Whereas when you're kind of working more on your own and it's more of a personal vision, you're not encumbered with all that mm-hmm. so baggage, you know. And uh-huh. are, are you uh, no longer taking assignments from magazines and papers? Or Well, I, I do assignments, but I'm, I'm, I think that at this point I would prefer just to do my own projects in my own in my in my own way, mm-hmm. without having to. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess it depends on the magazine assignment and how interesting it would be to me personally. But just kind of having another tear sheet in my collection that doesn't really kind of interest me. I'm more interested in making kind of my own pictures in my own way and going to the places and photographing those places in the way that interests me. And and I, I don't. I'm not. Comp- if I want to go to a place and only shoot portraits. I don't want somebody saying, oh my God, all you do, you know, what about, what, is the, what does the place look like? Mm. <laughs> we right. haven't seen uh, Havana. What does Havana look like? We have all these tight portraits of people. They're great portraits, but uh, we don't get a sense of the street. You know, and there's no cars or there's, you know, we want pictures of the people working or playing. So I, I, uh, I would prefer just to do it, go there. And if I move to this way or that way, then I'll go in that direction. Mm-hmm. And the world has shut down recently, and travel writers, of course, people who travel the world and make a living from that, um, are you know oh. having a hard time right now. Um, but yeah, you and, and, and other photographers might have a pretty substantial back catalog with which you can play and rearrange and you know think about other, I guess, poetic objects as you mentioned, like books to to bide the time. Well, there's books. There's yeah, the exhibitions aren't really happening so much right now, but print sales are there. There's certain assignments that um, I, I've been asked to photograph uh, my family or my home. So, you know, things have changed a bit, but all the travel work that I was doing has been postponed since March. So I, I, had, a, I had a full schedule. I was going to go to uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Manila, Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai, to Italy. I had a lot of great plans, but it all it all just went away. Yeah. <laughs> just just down to zero. You want to be safe. Plus the getting to places is very difficult, getting in and getting out. Uh quarantining and all that stuff, even if you can go, it, it's just very complicated. So um yeah, I'm just mm-hmm. hunkering down, waiting for a, another time in the future. Right. I, I listened to uh, an interview that you did with uh, William Dalrymple not too long ago. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another wonderful travel writer. And in this interview, you spoke about how you broke into the world of photojournalism. And it's a wonderful story of you <laughs> smuggling yourself into Afghanistan. I think that was before the Russia days. Yes. Could you? Um, That's right. Yeah. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about this story? Sure. Just a quick note and we'll get right back to the episode. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review on your favorite podcasting app or consider supporting the show with only a few dollars a month at travelwritingworld.com slash support. So I, I got an invitation by just a couple of guys in my hotel some refugees it was like a two dollar night hotel in up in nor up in the mountains in Pakistan and they, they were telling me that oh there's this war raging across the border in Afghanistan and, and you know villages are being bombed and it's this terrible situation. And then they said, Well, you know, you're a photographer, why don't we take you in and you can show what's happening? So I, I kind of thought, well this sounds like a really interesting idea. I'd never been to a war zone. I didn't know. I kind of started to get a bit nervous about the whole thing, but I, I never, I, so I, but I, I, I went, went ahead. We crossed the border without a passport. I would just walk through the mountains <laughs> and stayed for a few weeks, photographed uh, these destroyed villages and refugees leaving and this really, the fighting. It was this incredible situation. I'd never been anywhere near anything like that. I, worked on a suburban newspaper in Philadelphia, and I was just, uh, you know, this was like something I couldn't imagine. 
And then when I, I left Afghanistan to return back to Pakistan to try and get my film processed, I again had to leave, I had to cross the border illegally without my passport. So I got very nervous that maybe I'll get stopped, I'll get searched, maybe they'll wonder like, who am I and why isn't your passport stamped and are you a spy or whatever. So I decided if I if I did get stopped and searched, I would try and hide some of my exposed film somewhere in my clothing and then I would put the sort of dummy film in the camera and, and in, in the camera bag to try and, you know, mm-hmm. keep this exposed film safe. So that's why I kind of sewed it into my shirt and my pants. Yeah, you know, they wore these, this costume called the show art chemise, this very baggy pants and this big flowing shirt. So there was a lot of sort of space to put the film in um, at, a, at a jacket. Uh, so I was able to do that. So I was able to get it out into Pakistan. I took a bus to India, went to Delhi, and eventually gave my film to kind of a friend of a friend to, to have it taken back to, to New York to have it processed and all that. Well, that sounds risky. <laughs> I was, I was really, I, I thought this was insane to go in into a war zone with people I don't know. I didn't speak the language. You know, bullets and bombs are going off. It just seemed like it, but I, you know, it was a, a really important story, and I, I just thought this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about this story in light of the age of Instagram. I, I got an, an email from Google the other day telling me that they're going to pull back on their online photo storage because it's unsustainable for them. I guess they 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 said that they get around 30 billion photos uploaded each week. Holy smokes. And and that got me thinking about, you know, Instagram and, you know, how many images we see on Instagram are kind of the same sorts of images, you know, and yeah, you know, the, 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 the amount of risk or putting yourself out there to do something kind of against the grain as a necessary part for a photographer or a writer or anyone who's creating uh, to do something interesting or to do something compelling. And so that's why I'm kind of thinking about the risks in, 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 in your story here. It seems like that that risk helped propel you and you know helped your, your career. Well, it was a piece of history which very, very few photographers were documenting, just mm-hmm. a handful. And um, it was highly dramatic and, and, and it was emotionally charged. So, yeah, you know, all the pictures floating around the world today, looking at the glass half full, I think it's great that we all have a camera now on our phone. We can all photograph each other and, you know, Mm -hmm. important days, you know, birthdays, weddings, see a friend. And we we can really document our lives. But I don't see that they're really in the history of photography or I I don't see that as competing with – a photographer, like a fine writer who goes out and describes something or writes a book about a particular place in a very talented, in-depth way, any more than all the words flying around are going to make any difference. I think some there's some really gifted writers who are writing books and poems and essays uh, or screenplays, you know, and that work will survive and all the text messages will disappear. Mm. I kind of compare it to that. So some writers, some writing will, you know, survive and most won't. Right. That's a good, a good comparison there. I'm, I'm a teacher by day and some of my colleagues complain, oh, the students aren't reading, the students are reading. And I say, hold up, they're actually reading more now <laughs> than they've ever read. Right. That's not to say that the yeah. quality is any good. They're reading text messages and stuff online. But right. I think that's a pretty good uh, analogy. Um, yeah. Going back to, you know, your your days um, in Afghanistan and in that part of the world, um, I think travel writing often gets some some pushback um, for, I don't know, for othering and perpetuating stereotypes. And it seems that photography gets lumped in together here with writing sometimes. Um, they talk about like the imperial or the violent heritage of taking photographs, right? We We shoot film and we take pictures. Uh, that like 
photography maybe has an implicit power dynamic, right? If you're taking a picture of someone. So I'm wondering if, uh, what your thoughts are on, on, on this topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's some people that, that, you know, have a lot of time on their hands and they're searching for an idea or a thesis uh, put forth about whatever, you know, imperialism. I think a lot of it's just nonsense. Uh, obviously, you know, during periods of the British Raj, as an example, there were photographs that re- reflected life in that time, the subjugation of a people and, and the particular point of view. I think that they're important pictures. I mean, they, they, they show, you know, that sort of racism. But I think that if I go to India or if an Indian photographer comes to the U.S. or a French photographer goes to uh, Nigeria or South African photographer goes to, to France and, and views it in his or her way, we all photograph and we all write in different ways. Some people uh, have all different kinds of styles and motivations. And you can always find somebody who, you know, has a dark vision or whatever. But if somebody comes to New York from Poland or Russia or China and photographs the city, which I lived in for 40 years, fine. You know, you know, we want different points of view. I don't know. I, I don't I don't buy that premise that you mentioned. <laughs> I, I think that uh, it's all, you know, kind of fair game. When I look at the way, say, Indians and Indian photographer, and I know a lot of in, a lot of wonderful Indian photographers, and I see the kind of work that they do, and the influences that they've had from you know Henri Cartier-Bresson or Henri Cortez or whoever, that their pictures and what fascinates them about their country isn't so different than maybe what you know Henri witnessed. But I don't really want to be told what I'm supposed to photograph any more than as a writer say, well, you know, you're you're a a white guy, you're an imperialist, therefore certain things are off limits, or we don't want you photographing anybody looking this way or that way, or per se. I don't know. I I guess uh, there's always somebody that you know wants to you know have a debate about do you make pictures or you take pictures <laughs> and that that's an endless conversation did you you know so you do you take it or do you make it it's like my feeling is you know does it matter like who cares the semantics of the thing and if i want to if i go to india and i'm fascinated say with you know taking a train ride across the country i'm not suggesting that india is not a part of the modern world i don't feel like i need to show uh, somebody on a laptop with a cell phone. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Whatever. In, in the end, you know what? You have to create and make your own work based on what fascinates you and what interests you. Life is short, and I think that you you have to kind of do the kind of work that is satisfying and uh, fulfilling to you personally, and not say, well, you know, what are people going to think? Mm-hmm. And am I, you know, am I being respectful? And I think you need to, obviously, that's the thing. If, if you're being respectful and giving, you know, treating people with dignity, I think that's all that really matters. And if I'm fascinated with architecture or dance or food or still lives or landscapes or nudes or cars or flowers, that, that's, that's my business. And I, I don't really, you know, and if somebody wants to criticize that, God bless. That, 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 you know, if they want to... You know, if they want to be negative and whatnot, that's fine too. Whatever. Yeah, you'd mentioned um, this respect and the dignity and the ethics involved, and um, you know, I'm an amateur photographer myself, and I get anxious and I get fearful if I'm, you know, taking photographs of strangers on the street. You know, this just builds up in, inside. So, how how would one? I guess. Well, how- you know what you you can negate you, you can negate the entire history of street photographer. And and one can say, you know what, you should only ask permission. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, all of street photography, uh, you can negate negate all of that. And uh, I don't know, I I think that are we really want to live in that kind of world where we don't want to photograph life as it as it is? Again, I think this is some kind of academic 
thing where somebody, you know, I, I guess in France and Germany or whatever, there's strict laws about photographing people on the street. Mm -hmm. So anyway. In, in, your, in your book, you have a lot of wonderful kind of street images, but you also have these very intimate and personal portraits of, of individuals. So very selfishly, like, how do I approach someone on the street, say I'm traveling somewhere and I'm fearful, I'm anxious, well, it's, it's, you know, how do I ask them? Yeah, it's, yeah so what, what you do is you, you put one foot in front of the next, <laughs> you walk up to them and say, you know, you actually talk to them. Oh my God. Oh my God, you actually, you know, you talk to them. It, it's, it's painfully simple and all you really need to do is just talk. Take the time and, uh, to, to go up and actually say the words, you know, can I... And if you do it in a, you know, a respectful way, in a friendly way, 99.9% .9 of the time people will say yes. It, it, it's, it, there's no magic. There's no, no skill involved. It, it literally, you just have to have the, the courage to walk up to somebody and say, you know what, you fascinate me or, uh, you know, I think you, you really look interesting. W would you agree to let me photograph you? I'm doing a project on, you know, this or that. Mm. It's really the – it's just a question of literally having the courage. Mm -hmm. And a lot of interesting portraits in this book. Uh, and so this is coming out pretty soon. Um, I believe it comes out the 23rd or the 24th of November. It's a beautiful, big book. And so what's next after this? Like what, what's going on, uh, Lockdown Life? What, what are you up to? What's, what's next? Well, I'm continuing to go to my archive. I'm working in a, um, a studio spending time with my daughter every day with her, working on another book, working on another two books. <laughs> wow. So, uh, I, you know, it's I, I have a lot to do. I wish, I, and the days are so short, but I just uh, try to do the best I can. But the life is good. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very, I feel very blessed and lucky to be where I'm at. And um, you, you just never know, you know, you just have to appreciate it each day as it comes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, stay safe out there, and when you resume traveling, uh, continue to stay safe. Uh, where can people find more about you and your book online? Well, I guess just my website, uh, stevemccurry.com. I, I guess that's it, and then I guess on my Instagram account. Okay, well, we'll put those links in the show notes to this episode. Thank you so much for your time and, and speaking with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. You can find the episode show notes and much more at TravelWritingWorld.com. Please remember to subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app. And if you find the show valuable, please consider leaving a review or supporting the show with only a few dollars a month at TravelWritingWorld.com support.